It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. A new round of documents on the Kennedy assassination has been released. Now, the docs don't shed new light on how Kennedy was killed, but they do shed light on the long-running U.S. effort to overthrow the Castro government in Cuba. Joining me now is Peter Kornblu, director of the Cuba Documentation Project at the National Security Archive in Washington, D.C. He is co-author of Back Channel to Cuba, The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. Welcome, Peter. What to you is significant about these new JFK documents and what they contain about Cuba? Well, what's significant is that almost none of them are new. There's only actually 52 new documents that we haven't seen before that have been released out of these 2,800 documents. All the other ones have been released as part of the JFK Act before and now are being released with less or no redactions. Uh, so many of the documents that you've looked at uh, are actually ones that have been out and around for a while. Um, many of them do address the issue of U.S. covert interventions, efforts to assassinate uh, Fidel Castro and roll back the Cuban Revolution. Um, and that's because the original JFK uh, commission uh, that was in charge of identifying relevant documents made a very appropriate and, um, and broad definition of what a JFK-related document was. And because the whole issue of Kennedy trying to kill Castro and, and rumors that Castro might have retaliated uh, by killing Kennedy, because this became a conspiracy theory in the folklore of the Kennedy assassination, um, all the documents related to U.S. covert operations, assassination plots, and the violent terrorist activities of, of Cuban exiles who, who once worked for the CIA, all of those documents uh, have been released uh, over the years. There's still some more to be released, um, but um, uh, in this last uh, release of documents, we, we did find those Cuba documents. So let me read uh, one excerpt, and you can tell me both if it's new and also uh, just comment on its significance, because it's gotten some attention. Uh, this is an internal planning document where U.S. officials are discussing plans for operations, covert operations uh, related to Cuba. And one says, um, it's, it's dated April 12, 1962, and it says, we could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. The terror campaign could be pointed at Cuban refugees seeking haven in the U.S., we could sink a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, real or simulated. We could foster <laughs> attempts on lives of Cuban refugees in the U.S., even to the extent of wounding in, in instances to be widely publicized. So, Peter, is this something that we're learning for the first time, or is this um, old knowledge? And your thoughts on what this means here, because here we have U.S. officials talking about launching an attack inside the U.S. Yes. This was a, a, a series of proposals, not by the CIA, but by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Joint Chiefs wanted to invade Cuba again after the Bay of Pigs uh, and handle it themselves. They were angry that the CIA had bungled the uh, paramilitary invasion of Cuba. But for the Joint Chiefs, they needed to, a date to actually attack Cuba. So the issue for them became how to create a pretext or a justification for attacking Cuba. And their, their underlings came up with this whole set of proposals, some of them extremely Machiavellian and sinister, like the one you just read about, about the terrorism campaign in Miami and Washington. There was a, another idea that was called for, you know, kind of pretending to blow up a plane uh, and, um, and claim that a bunch of people who weren't real people uh, were killed on it and blame Castro uh, for it. Um, so, and this was part of a, a series of proposals called Operation Northwoods. Uh, and those documents did come out because of the John F. Kennedy Assassinations Record Act in the 1990s. They caused a lot of uh, discussion. Um, but it was also clear uh, that these were these, you know, creative and horrible uh, and sinister proposals, but that the President of the United States never really looked at them and certainly never accepted them. Uh, and they were obviously never. Uh, implemented. So what we're seeing here are other documents 
that are drawing on those Operation Northwood proposals and presenting them again, and in this case, in a meeting context. And you're, this document is a document about a, an Operation Mongoose meeting where they're deciding what they're going to do for Operation Mongoose. And part of the suggestion is this campaign, but of course, this campaign was never uh, implemented. This campaign was never accepted. Let me read one more um, idea that was discussed. It was spitballed, but it wasn't implemented. Uh, but um, it says, specifically the possibility of producing crop failures by the introduction of biological agents which would appear to be of natural origin. Mr. Bundy said he had no worries about any such sabotage which could clearly be made to appear as the result of, lo of local Cuban disaffection or of a natural disaster, but that we must avoid external activities such as the release of chemicals, etc., unless they could be completely covered up. So essentially, biological sabotage. Well, the Cubans have always argued uh, that the CIA and, and other agencies of the United States did over the years use some kind of chemical and biological poisoning of, of the crops when there would be a, a swine flu epidemic or, or, or a, a, an actual epidemic of livestock in Cuba over the years. The Cubans often um, blamed it on the, the CIA. It was it's very hard to know. Obviously, the U.S. intelligence agents and the U.S. intelligence community um, and the covert operatives in our government back then considered this part of their, you know, bag of dirty tricks against Cuba. But we don't know for sure that these operations were actually implemented. That's not to say that a whole set of very sinister and, and illegal and criminal operations uh, weren't in, implemented. Over the years, we tried to kill Fidel Castro in every conceivable way. We trained exiles who became, you know, major league international terrorists. We had them on the payroll, taught them how to use explosives. Um, we invaded Cuba. Uh, we, we had an embargo. We launched Operation Mongoose. And, you know, because of Operation Mongoose, Fidel Castro accepted the Soviets' offer of, of having nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba because he feared another U.S. Uh, attack, another U.S. invasion. So the, the history of Cuba and the United States is replete with very sinister operations. Whether these that are mentioned in the documents were ever implemented um, seems um, unlikely. Um, uh, and I can't say for sure that we didn't use biological chemical warfare on Cuba in a limited way over the years, but, um, but, but uh, it's never come out that we have. It's never come out that, that that particular idea that you just uh, mentioned that's in the document that was discussed at that Operation Mongoose meeting was actually ever uh, implemented. You know, that background that you outlined to Cuba's decision to allow Soviet nuclear missiles uh, on its territory, um, it's striking how missing, absent that is, from the history so many of us get about uh, the Cuban missile crisis. It's just, but it's important context that you've outlined there. Um, finally, Peter, so... Right. Today is, today is October 30th, and, and two days ago, on the 28th of October, was the 55th anniversary of the kind of official end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, hmm. uh, when Khrushchev, 55 years ago, decided to pull out those missiles from Cuba. But, of course, secretly, he had come to a deal with John Kennedy. Khrushchev would pull out those missiles, and Kennedy would uh, eventually secretly um, uh, order the withdrawal of Soviet uh, of U.S. missiles that were parked in uh, in Turkey and and uh, got alongside the uh, the Soviet border. So there was a secret deal made to end the crisis, but it's a real thing. It's a real issue. But Kennedy, I take it, didn't agree to stop terrorizing Cuba because that continued well after him, right? Well, covert operations continued, but you know, if you read our book, uh, Back Channel to Cuba, and if your listeners do, you'll see that Kennedy, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, became a, had very different thinking about uh, U.S. policy towards Cuba, and he actually started down the road towards significant secret diplomacy with Fidel Castro that was culminating right at the moment that he was killed. There's some conspiracy theorists that think he was killed because of his secret outreach and communications with Fidel Castro. Um, you know, I, I don't know if your listeners know, but on the very day, the very moment that Kennedy was killed, he had an emissary, a French journalist, meeting with Fidel Castro uh, in Veradero Beach. Uh, and they were talking about Kennedy's message that, that uh, this journalist carried to Fidel, which was basically, you know, we have some concerns, you need to do this and you need to do that, but perhaps coexistence is possible. Uh, and news came in while they were talking that Kennedy had been shot and Fidel turned towards uh, this French journalist, Jean Daniel, and said, 
there goes your mission of peace. And then the next thing he said is, they're going to say we did it, which is exactly what happened. Hmm. Cuba has been thrust into this whole conspiracy folklore uh, as either a reason for the assassination or the actual perpetrator of the assassination. Um, and uh, that's why you're seeing so many documents in the JFK assassination release that deal with Cuba. You know, uh, given Kennedy's record in not just in Cuba, but also especially in Vietnam, I I'm skeptical of claims that try to cast him as, a, as an enlightened diplomat towards the end of his life. But I didn't know that, what you just said. So that's, that's really important you should, information. Yeah. You, you, have to read, you have to read the book, and I think you'll find uh, <laughs> the effort Kennedy was making somewhat compelling. Fair enough. Uh, so finally, Peter, given all these um, plots uh, that the U.S. has discussed and in some cases enacted against Cuba, has Cuba ever tried uh, any legal channels to get compensation from the U.S. or, or some sort of uh, legal decision to get it at least to stop or even apologize? Well, the, the Cubans have certainly demanded again and again and again that the embargo be lifted. They've taken a resolution to the uh, United Nations every year in October for the last almost 30 years. Almost every single year, the overwhelming vote, you know, 130, 132 countries to two, you know, the United States and Palau or the United States and Israel or um, the United States is on the receiving end of world condemnation of its overall policy towards Cuba. And that is part of what uh, actually compelled uh, uh, President Barack Obama uh, to go ahead and, and make a breakthrough in the intransigent policy towards Cuba. It was uh, the world, uh, world opinion, and particularly opinion in Latin America. Um, the Cubans uh, don't really like the idea of going to the world court because they don't, uh, they don't really like, they think that the court could someday be used against them. Um, and of course, U.S. law has been used against them. They've had their assets frozen here. And, uh, but, um, you know, we're, we're in a debate over Cuba policy. These old documents are still relevant today. Uh, the Cubans are very concerned about what Donald Trump uh, might do. Um, uh, aggressively towards the island of Cuba. Cuba's in a big political transition with Raul Castro stepping down in just a few months as president of Cuba. For the first time, there will be a president of Cuba that doesn't have the name Castro since the Cuban Revolution. So uh, so it's a, it's a very dynamic time. We should use these documents, even if they're not brand new to us, we should use them to remind ourselves with the history of U.S. policy towards Cuba has been and really pushed for a much better non-aggressive and civil policy towards, towards the island of Cuba. Well, Peter, for many years, you've been helping us understand that history. So we thank you for that and thank you for joining us today. Peter Kornblu, director of the Cuba Documentation Project at the National Security Archive in Washington, co-author of the book, which I have to read now, Back Channel to Cuba, The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. Peter, thank you. Thank you. Call me back when you're done reading it. Will do. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.